Hello, everybody. Welcome back. It's Thursday night. This is the Producers Perspective Live. It is the 147th week of our live streams here, or it just feels that way. Hello, Helene. Welcome back. Welcome back to all of you. We're seeing so many familiar faces. It's starting to feel like a cheers bar. Like this is a place where everyone knows your name. Hi, Mary Alice. Hi, everybody. I love when the emojis in there keep them coming. Um, I'm still, I don't know about you, but I'm still on a high from Jen Colella last night. I mean, I'm feeling pretty good about that. If you miss Jen Colella, make sure you watch the replay because she will keep you floating on air throughout this thing. Uh, Mary will throw up the, the link on where you can watch all of the replays. Uh, but Jen Colella last night, fan fantastic. So go watch the replay. Uh, tonight, Mr. Joe Iconis, Mr. Be More Chill himself, Mr. I've had my music streamed a billion times. Uh, Mr. Joe Iconis will be here in just a few moments. If you like Oh Broadway Bounty Hunter as well, which I caught off Broadway, Love and Hate Nation, I mean, this guy is killing it. Um, if you like Joe Iconis, hit that like button right now. I want to see some likes go up. I want to see some hearts. I want to see some comments. Let me see him. You know why? The, uh, Joe will just, he'll, he'll, he'll like us more if we do that. There's some. Look at, uh, really, we do that because we want more people to watch. Why do we want more people to watch? Because the more people that watch, the more people that may give to the Actors Fund. And that's why we're here to raise money for the Actors Fund. And we're really, we're, we're starting to, oh, look, the hearts are coming in now. I love it. Um, we are uh, really starting to raise some good, some good cash here, which is good. It's going to go to some very good use. and A lot of people could use it. So thank you for that. Joe, we'll take some questions. So if you've got some. Uh, and I think this was Drew's idea. Drew, are you there tonight? There he is, cold, rainy Baltimore Drew. Uh, he, You know what he does? He puts questions in all caps before he asks this question. And my eye goes right to it. And as I'm like, I don't know if you've seen this, I'm trying to figure out how to keep talking and engaging with the guest and also pick a question. Uh, so if you see me doing that, it's I'm not watching like Wimbledon on my other monitor over here um, or old Wimbledon because there is the Wimbledon now. But I'm trying to figure out questions. And anyway, put question there and I'll go to it. So if you have questions for Joe, go ahead and throw it in there. We announced last night that we um, were invited to take place in a very uh, take part of a very special Facebook program where they allowed the users to purchase stars that you could throw at us and give money to the Actors Fund. So we announced that last night because Facebook invited us to be a part of this very special pilot program. And then today they told us it was just for video gamers. Thank you, Mark Zuckerberg. Video gamer, I have not. I was when I was about 12, but not anymore. Apparently Broadway folk are just not as important as video gamers. Maybe we'll stream on Pinterest tomorrow night instead of Facebook. Uh, I also need your help on something else. I need your help a lot these days, the Actors Fund and sharing this sucker. And also I posted a blog today. Everyone's talking about how do we get Broadway back up and running. And we're working on how to do that, of course. And I'm on a whole bunch of committees with a bunch of very fancy Broadway people coming up with ideas on how to do that. But what I'm also worried about, what we're all worried about is how do we make our theater goers comfortable to come back? It's one thing to light our lights and raise the curtain, but how do we make people feel more comfortable about coming? What's it gonna take? Is it gonna take a vaccination? Is it gonna take government leaders telling us it's okay? Is it gonna take us taking temperatures at the entrance? Who knows? I wanna know if you have ideas on what uh, what may make theater goers more comfortable, go to the blog, throw it in the comments. I'm literally going to print out all these comments or email them all to, to Broadway leadership. So they want to see it. So check the link in the, in the comments and um, I will forward it on and your input really matters. You guys are theater goers, right? So go check that out. Okay. Enough of that nonsense. Let's get to the real stuff. Please welcome to the live stream, Mr. Joe Iconis. Welcome Joe. Hey. There he is. There I am. How are you? You look very know, casual. Man. You look very, very casual. Like, very, they're like very comfortable, casual, dark lounge. 
Mm -hmm. Nice. This is uh, this is my bedroom where I'm at <laughs> right now. Um, yeah, you know, like setting the mood. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah. It's actually it's funny because I, I I feel very comfortable like in suits. Like I feel super comfortable like fairly dressed up. And whenever I have to be in a situation where I'm dressed like casually, I don't know what the hell to do. And so for any like any like Zoom or like streaming thing during this quarantine, it's been a nightmare for me because I'm like, what do normal people wear at home? Do they wear sweaters? I guess I'll wear a sweater. So I don't know what I'm doing. You should have worn a suit. I should have, but then I was like, this is gonna be weird. I've actually done it a couple times and I feel like people look at it and they're like, who's this asshole wearing a suit on his couch? <laughs> so, you know, I'm trying, I'm, I'm negotiating casual wear. Now I know why one of your first shows was called The Black Suits or why you named that band that, is yep. that true? Yeah, man, I've just always like been into, uh, into a, you know, into to suits and into to, uh, formal menswear. <laughs> Well, look, one of one of the viewers already think you look very cool. Where oh, you thanks. Are. I love thanks. it. I love yeah. it. Yeah. This this Hi. painting behind me is this painting behind me is velvet, so that makes it really nice. Very fancy. Very yeah. fancy. Where did you get it? Um, I got that at a flea market, Hell's Kitchen flea market. Nice. And yeah. that, that that's where you are right now. Are you in Hell's Kitchen? Are you in the heart of the city still? Hell's Kitchen, Heart of the City. Uh, I was on Long Island for the very top of the quarantine, and then I came uh, back to my home, which is in Hell's Kitchen. And uh, my family was a little bit like, "Why are you going back to the city, which is the epicenter of this entire thing?" Uh, but it just felt uh, it felt correct, and uh, my wife is here, so you know, no, her well, fault. yeah, <laughs> her fault. Have you walked around the Broadway Theater District at all in the in the midst of this on a on an excursion? No, I right? haven't. Yeah, I haven't. I I mean, I I'm, it's. I, I I would and I will. I just I've really been uh, I've really been in the apartment. I haven't ventured out a whole whole bunch. You know, it's um it's it's hard. It's like it's uh, there's something that's um uh it's just it, it's weird to see the city as empty as it is. You know, mm -hmm. and so um yeah, it's been hard for me to like venture into the the center of things. But but I will from my window. I can see the um the sign of the the Milford Plaza. Which is no longer called the Milford Plaza, but it uh, the like the the unilluminated sign of the Milford Plaza gives me hope every day. When I, I literally look at it every day, I'm like, okay, she's still I just, there. I just fell in love with you just a little bit more for you just saying the Milford Plaza. I mean, yeah. it just like my man crush on you just grows. That was the first hotel I stayed at when I came to see Phantom of the Opera back in like 1989 or something. Oh, nice. Did you go oh, to Mama yeah. Leone's? I wanted to. I so wanted to. <laughs> like I couldn't get in. There was a line at the door, and I was like, "That's the restaurant from the Billy Joel song." <laughs> yeah, it's not. It really was. <laughs> Have you been working through this period? Are you inspired to write, or are you not inspired to write? What's the creative process like for you? You know, I'm I'm in a weird spot where I so this like this chunk of time, uh, I had sort of blocked out anyway in my life. Uh, Cause I've, you know, I've sort of come off of like two plus years of like back to back work, like nonstop work. And so I had like blocked off this time to work on some uh, very specific projects uh, just as writing time. And so I have these, these deadlines that kind of remain, you know? And so I've, 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 I've sort of been like, okay, well it's, you know, the world is, the world is very different than I thought it was going to be when I first blocked off this time, but I blocked off the time. So I'll just use it and write. And so it's been a strange thing of like me, um, you know, really trying to force myself to to write and trying to be productive, uh, but it's 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 hard, you know. And I've 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 been doing okay. Like I've I've um, I'm trying to like you know sort of embrace the 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 fact that there's sort of you know no more rules, you know, and that it's um, there's a lot of things that it's like you know we don't we don't know what's going to happen, and so I'm I'm trying to let that sort of depressurize my writing situation, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's challenging, you know? Any tips out there that you've used to keep yourself going and up and how, how you actually battle through it? Yeah, you know, something that was, has been really helpful to me is what, uh, what this has, what the quarantine situation has done for me has given, it's given me a little bit more time to actually like take in, um, art uh which is just to say like obviously i'm not like you know going to see shows 
um, cause that's not possible. And also like how weird if I was going to do that right now. But, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm watching, like I'm watching movies that, that I've always wanted to see. I'm listening to albums that I, I've never gotten around to really like getting into and just like consuming art has really inspired me and it's really helped me and, and, and not in like a nuts and bolts way. It's not like, I'm you know, watching, you know, uh, like a you know when Wenders movie from 1984, and I'm like, oh great, now I'm going to steal that for my show. But it's just like it's it's inspiring me in a way that that feels like, uh, oh right, this is how I used to consume art back when I wasn't you know fully programmed at every second of the day. So what's a movie or an album <laughs> that you would not have seen or listened to if it wasn't for the pandemic that you have that you recommend other people see or listen to during this time? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I watched, uh, oh, I watched, uh, 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 um, Tiger King. You watched Tiger King. It's the, I did not watch Tiger. I, yes, I did watch Tiger. I have like a Tiger King thing. I, so like Tiger King, I think is, I think it's great. It's like the people who made it are very talented. It's like really awesome, but it just made me like so unbelievably sad, like the actual human beings that that thing was about. And then as soon as like everybody gets on board with one thing, I it's just in me to be like, no, 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 no. And yeah. so every room was so like excited about Tiger King. And I was like, absolutely not. Bums me out. I don't like how they treat the animals. And the only like character that I that I really was like, okay, I get why this person is like, is, is kind of appealing. And Tiger King was the woman who um, I guess killed her husband. And then it pissed me off that everyone was like, was attacking her for killing her husband because it seemed like if she did kill her husband, like maybe, like he wasn't the great, I don't even know. I'm, I'm not, I'm talking about it. I'm talking about stupid Tiger King. I didn't want to so talk about Tiger fault. King. It's, it's all your fault. You're part of the problem right now. I am part of the problem because I was listening too. My wife was like, you gotta watch this. I was like, that's the most ridiculous thing in the planet. I'm not watching it. Next thing you know, I'm like, Carol Baskin. No, I know Carol Baskin, yeah. And Jeff Lowe, my God. It's so, riveting, yeah. it's riveting. It's just, it just bumps me out. But I, you know what I watched? I watched uh, Near Dark, which is uh, Catherine uh, Bigelow's the I think it was her first movie that she made in '87, uh, and it's like a, a sort of um, like sort of westerny take on vampires, and so it's a lot of like brooding uh, vampires. There's a great uh, Bill Paxton performance, uh, and so that was a that was one that I would not have watched uh, had there not been like a free 90 minutes in my life, and uh, it was really inspiring. And I liked the way that it it used genre uh, without feeling like uh, cartoony or or goofy. You know, um, and it gave some like it gave some uh, some weight and some complexity to uh, vampire characters. So that was a great watch. So tell you had a couple shows. I mean, did you have two companies of Be More Chill that were abbreviated, like were cut short by this fucking thing? Yeah. It's, God damn it. Chicago and London, right? Chicago and London. Yeah, they were. Uh, they've been. They've been paused. I mean, in London. We were, you know, we were like in the meat of the run. Like we opened, it was, it was really well received. People were like digging it. It was, there was nothing but positivity surrounding the London run of the show. And, uh, and so it was so strange that it was just a sort of, you know, pause this way. And then Chicago, we were gearing up to, to be in rehearsals uh, last month. And then we were going to open, I mean, it was like right around now where we would have opened in Chicago. Uh, and so that's just been, um, as of now, postponed until uh, later in the, the summer or fall. Um, but you know, like everyone, we're just kind of waiting to see what's gonna happen. As a, as a creator of these works, you know, there's been lots of talks about how, how we come back and what we do with audiences. If you had a choice of like an audience coming back a month or two early, but they had to be four or five empty seats in between them, would you want that or would you just want to wait the month and let everyone sit side by side and pack the house? I don't, oh man, I don't even know. You know, I think that, I think that it's, you know, I, if it, the, the safety thing is the thing that, that, you know, it takes precedence over anything to me. And so if like, if there was a world where someone was like, it is absolutely safe, to have people in a room, they just have to sit far apart. And I think my impulse would be like, cool, let them sit far apart and let's all like revel in the weirdness of this moment. And then we'll sit close together and we'll appreciate that even more. You know, I like, I like whatever it is being transparent about it. You know, I like, I like being in a, a theater anyway and, and, and ha having everyone kind of be on the same page, you know? And so I think that 
um, you know, whatever, whatever we got to do. I'm, I'm, I'm for whatever gets shows happening as soon as, and as, as soon and safely as humanly possible. Mm. So, yeah, I would, I would certainly, if someone told me that it was safe for myself and others to go sit in a theater, a few people apart, I'd be like, great. Awesome. Love yeah, it. I mean, I guess there's some people that'd be like, when you take an airplane ride and like no one's sitting next to you, you're like, yes, raise that armrest and hang out and throw a bag there. I mean, some people actually might find it more comfortable. Well, if we're going to be real about it, people are always bitching about theater seats. And everyone's always complaining about it. You're so cramped and everything. And so it's like, you know, as long as it's safe, you feel, I'd feel like there's like thousands of people. <laughs> and be like, finally, seats on either side. <laughs> Will you write about this period of time? Or will it affect any of your show? I was trying to think about this today. Like, if you're, and I don't know this history, so this is just total postulation, but mm -hmm. plays that were written in the year after World War II ended, right? Or mm -hmm. a couple years after, if they were set in the present day, they had to be set, like they had to deal with just what happened somehow. Everyone was coming home from a war deal with something. So do you think if you're spreading something in the present day, you have to address this issue or will we pretend it never happened? It's, I mean, I think that, you know, I, I think that writers' responses in general will be totally different depending on the type of writers they are to this. I think for me, it's, it kind of depends on the, the world of the, the show. You know, I feel like it's one of those things that it's, it, it won't, you know, for me, I won't be able to help being affected by this experience, whether I'm setting out to write mm -hmm. a show that feels like it is aware that this, you know, pandemic happened or or not, I'm it's 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 going to creep its way into my writing. You know, I'm working on a show right now that's this musical about Hunter S. Thompson. That's the thing that I'm kind of working on um, in the last few weeks. And you know, and that that show is like a it it bounces all over in, in time. You know, it's in 2005, and then it's in 1965, and then it's in, you know the 70s, 80s. It's all over the place. Um, but you know, with that, it's like I, as I write, I feel like I. With the thing that I'm the thing that I'm tapping into as far as the 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 COVID situation goes is I'm tapping into this sense of like something is hovering over America and everyone is experiencing it. And no one quite knows what it is, but it's something that it's a it's a national uh, strangeness that seem that's that's in the air. And that's something that was like in the show before, but it's just sort of naturally coming out now. And I can, you know, and I'm, I'm not even thinking about it as I'm writing it, but then I'll write something like, oh, that's like, like I'm writing about uh, what's going on outside right now without actually literally writing about it. So I think that'll be, that'll be how I'll, how I'll do it going forward. You know, I, I can't see myself writing like a quarantine musical, but who knows? So talk to us, you're writing this Hunter Thompson musical now. Tell me what, like, you'll wake up tomorrow and mm -hmm. what would Joe Iconis, composer, lyricist, are you writing the book for this as well? Uh, yeah, Co-writing the book, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so what What does your tomorrow, like, how do you start tomorrow, wherever you are in it? What do you, what do, you do first, especially when you're tackling all three elements? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, for 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 this particular write, writing job on the show, I'm kind of going through the last version that we had of it and just and looking at every piece of writing in the entire show. Uh, and so it's a it's a sort of really specific uh, you know kind of writing process. But um, I, I've, for this, I've been I've been when I'm in the script, I'm just going in order, you know, and so I'm like starting at the top and just working my way through. And then on top of that, I'm just reading a ton. Like this is a show because it's about Hunter S. Thompson and because it's about America sort of through the decades. Uh, there's just so much research that is necessary with every line. And so it's the kind of thing where like, you know, I'll write, you know, I'll write some line about Richard Nixon and then I'll have to be like, okay, would, wouldn't Nixon have said that in 1972? Let me try to find that. So it's a lot of like cross-referencing as I'm, as I'm going. And uh, because of that, it's just a challenging, uh, it's a challenging writing process. It's not sort of like a fun and fancy free, you know, just like, oh, letting the muse take me and going wherever. <laughs> it's like, it feels like work. Like it feels like, I feel like I'm a, a librarian uh, at every moment. And it's been, um, I've been in it for weeks now. And what's, you know, it's, What's wild about this time is that, you know, I normally my my life is is 
like I said, I've, I've you know got meetings and things and shows and rehearsals, whatever. And so I don't have any of that. So I've just been like in front of the computer uh, for weeks now. Um, and so sort of like figuring out the structure of a day and the structure of my writing day has been really challenging. You know, I'm also a writer who I love to write in public. Like I love to write in coffee shops or bars or restaurants or wherever and to not have that. Uh, I've been really feeling that. Like it's been like, like I, I'll get to a, a point where I just feel totally swamped and I'll think like, oh, this is where I would have gone to, uh, to you know, the, the Jolly Goat coffee bar right now. And I can't do that. So <clears throat> I'll just go to this side of the couch. You know, it's a lot of that. You just have your wife come over like, sit down and ignore me and drink coffee and, you know, try to pretend you're at the. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. Imagine if it comes to that. How creepy would that be? If I was like, hey, <laughs> Lauren, roll play put on, put on this costume. Wife. Yeah. Musical roll roll playing right? to, yeah, to get me to write my musical uh, with Andres Thompson. In relation to that, Wayne Stafford asks, are there any rituals you have to you have to do when you write? Very specifically worded question. Like, do you have to have a bottle of seltzer water? Or do you have to have a number two pencil? Like, or are you just more free form? I'm I'm more free form. I'm a really sloppy writer. And even when I even when I write songs, I, I think the thing that the thing that sort of defines my process is this kind of like whirlwindness. You know, when I'm like when I'm in it and when I'm loving it, I'm like, I'll write at the computer and then I'll get up and I'll write at a notebook. I'll write like pacing around my room and then I'll come and be like really still for a while. And so I'm sort of all over the place. Um, and I, I, I'm not one of those people who has ever had like a writing schedule. You know, I'm not a person who's like, I write every day from 6 a.m. to 12 p.m. Um, it's just, it's just all over the place for me, you know, and it's, it's, uh, and it's, and, and that I think is something that's, it's both helpful and, and challenging, you know, it's like at times like this, I'm like, oh man, I, I wish that I was one of those people who, you know, every single day you write from this time to this time, because I'd have some parameters or something. And now it just feels like, oh, you just, you know, sit there and. You just got to do it, you know. It's like a writing, a writing prison. But I, I wish something that I that I do like is I like a lot of noise when I'm writing, and so I, um, which is one of the things I love about writing in public because there's just this sort of like, you know, um, uh, pleasant distractions kind of on the periphery. <clears throat> The problem, of course, is if the distractions become like actually distracting, and so it's a fine line, you know. And so I'll, I'm I'm listening to a lot of music, but it has to be music that I'm either really familiar with or like wordless music, because anything that is anything that's too like word heavy, I'll my mind will immediately go there. Like Fiona Apple, who I love a lot, put out this new album. It's a really amazing album, um, but I haven't been able to listen to it a whole bunch because every time I put it on as I'm working, I, I'm like I'll be you know writing about Hunter S. Thompson, and then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, Fiona's wordplay there is so good. How fascinating! I'm gonna Google what that lyric actually is, and then I'm gonna Google why she was inspired to write that lyric, and then it's just then I'm gone, you know. Uh, Joanne Dean, uh, this, this is something, this is taking a comment out of my mouth. Congratulations on the cast recording release for Broadway Bounty Hunter, which I saw that show last year and I had a blast. And I can't wait to listen to this thing because that Annie Golden belted the fucking shit out of your stuff. Like, I've always been a fan of hers. I mean, who isn't? But I had never heard her sing like that. And frankly, I hired her for a reading like right after that because she was so amazing. Um, but uh, it's so much fun. Joanne Dean, she says, share that experience recording and plans going forward. Tell us what what's next for Broadway Bounty Hunter. What's next for the cast recording? How was it to do? Tell us. Yeah, about yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it was uh, it was an absolute dream to get to record this album. You know, listen, like we we've worked on B Bounty Hunter for years and years and years. Myself and my collaborators, Jason Sweetie Williams and Lance Rubin, and uh, it was a show that we wrote for Annie Golden. And it was, you know, a dream to get to do it off Broadway this past summer. It did not run for as long as we all hoped that it would run for, but we knew that we were taking a gamble doing this like, you know, huge ass uh, commercial musical off Broadway um, that, you know, wasn't based on like a movie or didn't have, um, you know, the Hugh Jackman in it or anything. Uh, and so, uh, and so we were so proud of the show. And, and when we closed, we, you know, we didn't know if we we're gonna get the opportunity to, to preserve it. We didn't know if it would have another life. And um, then thanks to our amazing producers, uh, Jennifer Ashley Tepper and, and Allison Bressy uh, and Ghostlight Records, uh, they, uh, they were able to make this album happen. And so everyone who worked on the show cares so much about it. And it's like not just the, the creative team, like the whole cast, Annie, her leading man, Alan H. Green, Brad Oscar, our villain, like Badia okay. Farah, all these amazing people, Christina Sidhu, I, I, I could just name all of them. It's just the, the greatest, most badass cast in the whole world. And uh, and our band, like our band led by Jeff Coe, 
uh, our band cared so much. And so it was, it really felt like a treat for everyone to get to record this stuff. And you know, the music is, the music is inspired by like 1970s soul and funk music, you know, Curtis Mayfield and, uh, and, and, uh, and so, so many, so many people. Um, and so it's, we've always thought like, oh, this, this show would make a pretty, pretty like bopping album. Uh, and I think it does, you know, it actually like, it reminds me of an album, like, of, like a rock musical from the seventies. And as we were making it, that was sort of the, the way that we thought about it. You know, the show itself is like, it's definitely a musical. It's like not one of those shows where you can like totally take the songs out of context and then do them wherever. I mean, you can, but it's like, you can't like fake them being from a musical. And so, um, you know, something like the Be More Chill album, the Be More Chill album has like a ton of dialogue and a, uh, it, and, it, and really has these sort of large musical sequences. With Bounty Hunter, we were like, let's have this thing be like under an hour. Let's let's make this like like you know like the Dream Girls cast album where it's like like the the hits, the highlights, boom boom boom, just like knock them all out. And uh, and that's what the album feels like. And the performances are just incredible. Uh, I feel so weird talking about it because I like had a, a hand in it, but I really uh, I really dig it, and I'm excited for people to 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 listen to it. And we're doing this uh, YouTube listening party. Uh, tomorrow. So if you go to the Ghostlight uh, Records YouTube page, yeah, look at it right there. Oh, yeah. Tomorrow night, yeah, oh, Friday. Mary. Friday. Yeah, there's always ready the graphic. Uh, oh, so good, Mary. Come on. Um, yeah, go there and myself and the cast and creators, and uh, we'll all be hanging out, and you can chat with us, and we'll all listen to it together and dance. Awesome. Uh, yeah. And I would imagine, have you already started to get inquiries on doing that show in licensing and regional and all over the world yeah 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 a bit you know i think it's um the show itself is uh i think it some people like freaks them out a little bit because the um the, the sort of hook of the show is that annie golden the amazing actor singer uh you know rock and roller annie golden plays this this musical theater actress of a certain age who's down in her luck and the name of the musical theater actress and the show happens to be annie golden and so the idea behind the show is that any actress who plays that role uh you she has to use her own name and she's playing a fictionalized version of herself and so the the kind of trick of the show is that there's actually far fewer references to the literal annie golden in the show than you think. It's like you sort of, you go to it and you think like, oh, I've seen this musical that's like literally about the life of Annie Golden, um, but it's it's really not. You sort of, it's kind of like a, a magic trick. And so we're so excited to see other productions of this show that um, have actors using their own names in the center because that's what it is. It's like a celebration of of people who feel marginalized. It's a celebration of people who, who feel like society has kind of placed them in a box that they want to be out of. And so it feels like, you know, what a great way to celebrate an actor who might have, you know, only ever or, or is typically cast as like the the best friend or like the kooky neighbor um, to have this actor not only be the lead of the musical and have this, you know, actor who's a woman of a certain age allowed to like be the center of her own story and be, you know, butt kicking and sexy and cool and do all this stuff, um, but also like have her like use her own name in the musical. You know, that's uh, so we're we're excited to see different different peeps do it all over the place. And um, another question just came in just about a little bit about your writing process. Mm -hmm. Tracy, George, when you're writing a show where you're writing the book and the music, what comes first? And if you're working on something else right now, you're working on anything else where this is the case, if you talk about that specifically, that I'd, I'd love to know myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for me, you know, I've done, I've kind of done all the different iterations. You know, I've done... Uh, I've done shows where I've just written the book. I've done shows where I've done book music lyrics. I've done shows where I've done just music lyrics, not the book. Um, and 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 for me, no matter what I'm doing, the thing that that I start with is the outline. Like I, even if I'm just writing the the score, I need to know, I need to know the characters like backwards and forwards. I need to know the the arc. I need to know how the 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 characters sort of play out over the course of the show. Um, I'm not someone who can just kind of like go in and like write songs that can sort of be placed anywhere. I'm like a pretty specific writer. And so I like to have so much information before I actually put pen to paper. And I and I, I talk endlessly about the thing before I actually start writing so that when I actually do start writing, I have all of this information and I feel like I know these people. And then it's like, it's so exciting when you discover things as you're writing 
it's so exciting then to be like, oh, wow, I didn't know this about this character who I thought I knew yeah. at the beginning of the process, you know? Um, but it's uh, it's different for everything. The other show that I'm working on right now is a show called Punk Rock Girl, which is the first thing I've done that uses pre-existing songs and a narrative. And so for Punk Rock Girl, I'm writing the book and then I'm uh, co-arranging the music with uh, Rob Rukicki, the great writer who wrote uh, Lightning Thief. And um, and for that, that's that's been something that I've, it's like a process that I have, I'm so unfamiliar with. Uh, the sort of writing of a of a jukebox musical, which is what it is. Um, and it's like a pretty subversive jukebox musical that's for young people, uh, but it's a jukebox musical nonetheless. And so it's sort of taking like pre-existing songs and and having to to create book around them is uh, it's just such a wild, wild thing, you know, that i'm I'm having fun with because the the story was one that I, you know, it was like a gig that I had to pitch. And so I came up with the whole story and I came up with how some of the songs fit in at the top. And so I really knew it going in. Um, but it's still, it's been like a really uh, interesting, interesting process to be like, okay, this is this song that, you know, Gwen Stefani wrote and I can't really change it all that much. <laughs> so we got to like make it work. I, in the context I of the you're doing that because it just seems like something that a composer lyricists would not want to do. So what made you go like, you know what, I'm gonna take off that very strong, unique voice that I have. I'm not gonna be able to take that tool out of the toolbox and I'm gonna dedicate what could be years of your life to this. So why, uh, why were you so attracted to not write music for a show? Mm -hmm. You know, um, I think that it's like, it's this thing that in the, uh, in the, building, in the building that I live in, uh, in New York City, they uh, I have to put like money in an envelope and give it to this guy who like owns the building. And if I don't do that, he kicks me out. Uh, and so uh, because of that, I was like, I should take this gig that pays me some money. <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally kidding, totally kidding, sort of uh, about this. No, but like truly, <laughs> this is a great mob story right now. Joe Iconis is indebted to the mob, leaves the Broadway briefing <laughs> tomorrow. Um, yeah, no, for sure. Uh, but no, I, you know, I did it for that very reason because I, you know, even in shows that I've written the book, <clears throat> I never written the book to anything that I didn't also write the score for. And I think that people know me as a, as a, you know, composer lyricist first. And so I thought it was a cool challenge to do something where I absolutely could not lean back on my songwriting abilities, you know, and I, I really love writing book to musicals. And as you know, it's, it's tricky because you know, as whenever, whenever, whenever people see that someone has written the book, music, and lyrics of something, they're like the dander immediately goes up, and people are immediately like, "Oh, you think you can do all three, huh? You know, do do you think you're Lin Manuel? Like it's that, like that's such a thing that's in us." And so I, you know, I and I've always been like, "No, I really love writing book. Like book is, I'm I'm very passionate about it." And so it was it was a cool way to, you know, it is a cool way to sort of hone that skill and do something that is just is just that, you know, I can't, I can't write lyrics to this. I can't really change the music. Um, and also the music arranging component is something that I'm really um, excited by and fascinated by and, and what you can do by changing the, the character of a song, what you can do by sort of rearranging bits of a song. It's stuff that I do in my own writing all the mm -hmm. time, but it seemed like a really cool, uh, you know, thing to, to attempt doing it with, with other music. And the other music that I'm working with is, um, you know, the, the show is all songs that were popularized by female rock and rollers. And so there's a lot of music that's, you know, punk music and, and sort of Riot Girl stuff, uh, like Bikini Kill and Slater Kinney, like songs that I really, really love. And uh, it's been nice to sort of put those songs in a theatrical context while also letting them retain their, their punky mix. Yes. Uh, so I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm stoked about that show. We're doing a production of it actually in October at the Argyle Theater on Long Island. And uh, tickets are like on sale now. So if you want to grab some tickets, Go check it get, out. Get those tickets. Do, uh, you know what? Your virtual listening party tomorrow night takes place at the same time as our live stream, but I'm going to just give everyone permission to go to the virtual oh, listening no. party. Provided they make a donation to the Actors Fund, so go check out the listening party tomorrow. I'm sure it's going to be a big hoot, a heck of a lot of fun. I love that you're doing that and just doing the book. It's just such another example of what I love about you. You're challenging yourself. It'll sharpen your skills, like on the other side of it, just because you you so like are. I mean, it's just it's just great, and it's something I should have expected you to do. Like you're that type of artist, uh, and um, I'm. So glad to know you, and uh, I'm so thankful you're here tonight. Yeah, man. No, thanks for having me. Of course. Great. It's been 
our pleasure. Say goodbye to Joe Iconis, everyone. Give him a big wave. And thanks for being here. Stay, stay safe out there. Thanks, my friend. Be good. Bye. Joe Iconis, everybody. Mr. Joe, a billion streams Iconis. He loves when I say that. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that as much as possible. Throw some stars, virtual or otherwise. I saw Sam threw some stars in there. If we can't do it officially, Mark Zuckerberg, we're going to throw them at you some way. Just watch it. I'm going to figure out a way to hack this. I'm going to hack this thing. Uh, so thank Joe for being here tonight uh, by throwing the Actors Fund some love. Go ahead and hit that little button on the tip jar. Tomorrow night, another very, very inspirational artist um, and one that I worked with on the Deaf West production of Spring, Spring Awakening. Ali Stroker will be here tomorrow night with a very special guest. Joe Benincasa, the head of the Actors Fund, will be here talking a little bit about what the Actors Fund does and where all that money you're donating right now, right now, non-subliminal message, I'm just telling you to do it, where it's gonna go. Uh, so Joe, Joe Benincasa will be here tomorrow night and then Ali Stroka will be here as our primary guest. And now get this, something to make you smile. Here's a good one. I mean, speaking of the Actors Fund, Brian Stokes Mitchell, who is, he, I mean, First of all, he tested positive. He got the old corona. He got it, and we're thrilled that he's doing much, much better, so much better that he led the impossible dream out of his window. He sang it, they shot it, and now you can see it, and it'll put a smile on your face. First of all, listening to Brian Stokes Mitchell sing Row, Row, Row Your Boat would make you smile. I listened to that song 27 times today, sung by the Wiggles. They don't make you smile. Brian Stokes Mitchell, I'd hear Row, Row, Row Your Boat. That would make me smile. Here he's singing The Damn Impossible Dream, which he did on Broadway. It's incredible. Go listen to it. Go watch that. Be inspired. Let it make you smile. And then come back tomorrow night. Or if you're going to go to Joe's party, make sure you catch us on replay because it's Ali Stroker tomorrow night. We'll see you then. Bye-bye. <laughs>